Um, we know that Yeshua mentioned that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, everything that was spoken about him. As a matter of fact, in John, he's, he says that uh, if you don't believe Moses, how are you going to believe me? And uh, so we know that the, the word of Elohim is Yeshua. Every dot, every tittle, everything reflects him. All the fullness dwells in him. Uh, but at Yeshua's, I call it Yeshua's Passover, um, because we know and compare, always compare it with um, the time of, uh, um, of the Exodus and everything that went on during that period with the lamb and the blood on the doorpost. And so usually the, the Seder meal in the Haggadah that is read during that time is to remember the, um, remember the uh, Exodus. But we also have an even greater Exodus um, at the time of Yeshua. And this is something that uh, we also need to consider. Now, we know that, I go to the next slide, um, uh, because everything there, um, we know there are certain, Yeshua knew exactly what Pesach he would be uh, offering up his life on. And we see that in, in different, uh, in Daniel, especially, I think it's, it's Daniel um, 927, um, where it talks about the um, sacrifices being cut off in the middle of the week. And we know that when Yeshua was sacrificed on that, on, on that day in the middle of the week, that's one of the keys to understand the date. So if we look at the calendar, the Yud, uh, Yud Dalit is the 14th of the month of Aviv, and it uh, fell that year in the middle of the week. Um, and so Yeshua already had an indication as to um, the particular Passover that he would uh, be, he would die on. So uh, the 15th is the, high, is the high holiday of the Feast of Matzot, but the 14th uh, is the Passover, the day of Passover, and it, the day, what they call the day of preparation, the day in which they slaughtered the sheep. Now, another indication came from, uh, uh, from John, chapter 12, when it said Yeshua uh, came up from uh, the wilderness to a place called Bet Oni. Bet Oni means uh, the uh, house of suffering and south house of affliction. And so we know that uh, it says seven, six days before the, before the feast. Now, there, there is a little bit of a discrepancy in my calendar here, because some people will, will argue a couple points here. Um, that, oh, I see, you're going to have to do some clicking <laughs> uh, to, um, yeah. Okay. I have, if we count six days before the high holiday of the 15th, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's the ninth uh, when he went up to bet, came up to bet Oni uh, to uh, have a, probably some say had the, um, the, the um, evening meal, the Shabbat, the entering of the Shabbat meal with Lazarus. Um, 
And then again, depending on what where you read, uh, it said the following day he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Now others will contend that, and they say no, he wouldn't have read for he would have done that on the Shabbat. Um, but would have rested on the Shabbat in Betuni, and then on Sunday, the 11th, uh, rode the donkey into the, the uh, but the problem with that uh, is the lambs for the slaughter were brought in by the high priest on the 10th of the month. And Yeshua being that he would fulfill that particular uh, aspect of being the lamb would have come into Jerusalem on the 10th at the same time they were carrying the lamb, the, um, the lambs into Jerusalem. Uh, and we know that there are times in which um, feast days can override um, certain other uh, laws and ordinances, but uh, it's not the point. Is it was a time in which, uh, and I, I think um, uh, the Christians basically celebrate his going in on the uh, on on Yom Rishon, on the first day of the week uh, into Jerusalem. So. Another aspect of the lambs, they were examined for four days um, before they passed the test of being qualified. And they, there would be no spot or uh, anything, a blemish of any kind. This is why they carried the, the lambs for these sacrifices on the tent and they carried them in so that they would not bruise themselves or and nothing would happen to them on the way uh, up to Jerusalem. And uh, they spent those four days in a very special place and the, the priest would examine them very, very thoroughly. Uh, and only on, if they qualified on the 14th, they would uh, then go to the slaughter. Um, if we notice even Yeshua in that early morning hours uh, when standing before Pilate, when Pilate said, I can find no fault in him, he's like the highest authority of the land because uh, there's a lot happening during this time when he was on trial. That, Caiaphas, the high priest, who really wasn't the high priest, but he had tore his garment, disqualifying himself from being the high priest. But the on the 14th, um, sometime like whenever Herod, I mean, whenever Pilate made that pronouncement, he could not find any fault in him. It was like a declaration that he qualifies for this uh, sacrifice. Uh, click again. I don't know what um, what's coming up again. Okay, yeah, uh, here the lambs. The lambs are being examined during this time, and then on the fourteenth, they would be. Yeah, it was the day of preparation. That was also called Pas Pesach, Passover and would lead into, the, and then notice uh, the Last Supper was not the Seder meal that the Jews normally celebrated. They celebrated it as the 15th that came in. It came in on the 15th. We have to remember a day, day, in, uh, a day begins uh, in the evening. So the day begins on the, in the evening. Um, then it was the evening, the going out of the 13th into the 14th that Yeshua was sitting with the disciples. And when he washed the feet and uh, from chapters 
practically from chapter 12 to chapter 17 of John is should be read that night, the night before the Seder, uh, because that's when Yeshua was actually sitting with the disciples. We know it was not the, the Jewish uh, Seder meal of the, uh, when the 14th was going out into the 15th of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Shabbaton, the day uh, uh, that uh, was the rest day. Um, one of the one of the things that happened during the meal, remember, Yeshua said, "Someone, one of you are going to betray me." And uh, the disciples were curious about which one it would be, and Yeshua said that it would be. Um, uh, the one that he would dip the bread into the uh, cup and give it to Judas. And well, he did give it to Judas. But they were, and then immediately after that, it says Satan entered into Judas. And Yeshua then said to almost like he said it to Satan, go, now go do what you basically have always wanted to do, go and uh, uh, go out and do what you are intending to do. The disciples saw him get up and go out and they, they said to one another, oh, maybe he is going out to buy food for the Seder, for that meal, that meal of preparation for the Pesach. So that's why there's a good indication that this, he was actually the, um, knowing that he's going to be on the execution stake um, and will not be around to celebrate the, the Seder meal with the rest of the nation. Uh, but he would die along with all the other sheep on the 14th day of the month in the middle of the week. Now, something that's very, very important and something that the religious Jews wanted to, uh, uh, wanted to prevent, and that is the three days, the three nights, or three nights, three days, whatever, in uh, the grave. As we know, he left, uh, Yeshua left some signs. Anybody wanna know what those two signs were that he was the Messiah? Did anybody want to? Uh, Venture here, I guess. What were the two signs that Yeshua left? Well, his bones weren't broken. Right. I'm not sure of the other one. <laughs> the, sign of, the sign of the prophet Jonah, as well as destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Three days, exactly. Those are the three. Now, Again, there's a lot of discrepancy, a lot of confusion, obviously, around this idea uh, that he would have to be in the grave these three nights, three days. And uh, or that would dis and that would disqualify him for and actually made him actually made it would make him out to be a liar now remember remember at the trial the thing that um, the two witnesses they call him fault he said there's there was uh, two witnesses that came in to um, to the court courtroom and testified that that's what he said that he would tear down the temple and rebuild it, right? <laughs> they weren't they weren't false witnesses. He was they actually he actually said that. 
that he would, um, and, and uh, of course with Jonah and in, in the belly of the whale for also that period of time. Uh, and like I said, this was the one thing that they really didn't want to happen. And, and they, uh, after Yeshua was uh, taken to the tomb, just before it was, uh, he said he died on the ninth hour. Now, again, Yeshua himself said uh, in, uh, if I remember right, um, is it Mark, uh, Mark 15, 25? Um, anyway, he said that there's 12 hours in a day. And we know the day, the day was divided up uh, into those hours. Because it, it uh, talked about in Acts 23, 23, the third hour of the, of the night. So we knew that there was a third hour of the night. And there was uh, the third hour of the day, uh, the ninth hour. Uh, many, uh, there, there's a number of scriptures that speak very clearly about this 12 hour day, 12 hour night. And it was divided into, um, of course, the hours in the, thir in the third hour. Um, we know that in the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out, um, cried out, uh, why have you forsaken me? And so in the, in the evening also in Acts 23, 23, it talked about the third hour of the night, which means from six in, say six in the evening until nine in the evening. The evening was called the third hour of the night. And you had the, the the uh, sixth hour of the night was midnight. The ninth hour of the night was three in the morning. And then, of course, you had twilight during the change, changeover of the morning and the evening. Um, these are, again, just proof that proves that Yeshua entered the grave just before the Shabbat came in in the evening uh, of the 15th and uh, then was in the grave for those three days. And after the Shabbat went out on the 50, on the end of the 17th, you see that on the 17th when the Shabbat went out in the evening. Yeshua actually came up out of the grave that night. He wouldn't have stayed in another night because then it would have been too long. But the um, we know that it happened because the first witnesses to the, his resurrection were the guards that were guard, you know, that were watching the tomb to make sure that the disciples didn't come and steal the body and make it sound like he was the, in, in the grave those, those three days, those three nights. Um, and, I, and it says that the, the priest, they paid, paid the guards to lie. So we knew that we had a lot of evidence that these scriptures were actually fulfilled. Then to, to cap, it, cap it off, I think was very, very significant, is the 18th, it's Yud Chet, meaning life, Chai. Uh, maybe press it again, press the, um, give the click again, should be, we have Yeshua coming up out of the grave uh, well, in the evening, but they, we know that 
there's extreme well too bad extreme significance to this this particular day um it says in leviticus 23 uh that on on the day after the shabbat you know there's only one one shabbat and that is the weekly shabbat the other the others that are are like a shabbat like the 15th is like a Shabbat. It doesn't say. It doesn't even say, uh, say Shabbaton. It just said a day of con a, a convocation and a day of rest. But when it talks about the Shabbat, it always speaks of the weekly Shabbat. It's never referred to it in any other way, but the weekly Shabbat. Uh, in Hebrew, some of the feast days are called a Shabbaton. And if, for example, like this, like this particular uh, year, um, uh, the fifteenth will be on Shabbat, so it's called a Shabbat Shabbaton, meaning it's a Shabbat but also a Shabbaton, uh, like a Shabbat. So you have a double. You have a feast day and uh, a Shabbat all coming on the same day but in this particular year and every once in a while you have this happen in the in the in the year and it's really neat when it when it does fall when the 14th does fall on the middle of the week uh to see the importance of yeshua's uh journey here but he his resurrection on the 18th You'd fit. Um, remember when uh, uh, Mary, uh, Miriam, Miriam of uh, Magdala, Mary Magdalene, uh, was at the at the grave on the first day after the Shabbat, and she was, you know, of course, grieving there. Um, and suddenly there was someone standing next to her and she thought it was the gardener. Um, but then he says something to her, says, says her name. She recognized his voice right away and said, master, master. Um, but Yeshua in the King James Version says to her, do not touch me. I haven't been to the father yet. This is extremely important. That what he said to her, what we have to, we'd have to ask our question, ask the question, what do you mean you haven't been to the Father yet? What, what needed to take place at that uh, on that day after the Shabbat? What was what was happening? on the first day after the Shabbat. The priest waved the first Omer Reshit, the first Omer of barley in the temple before they could eat it. They had the right. father. Yeah. Why did, he, why did he do that? What was the purpose? Because Yeshua is the first to rise from the dead. And he okay. Is uh, if we go to uh, Leviticus. Maybe I don't know. If, I don't know how how that works, but you could put up the Leviticus scripture. Um, yes. Leviticus 23 was uh, verse 12. It's a very, it's, it's so significant. 15, I think, 14 or 15, verse 14, 15.
this this is so significant what what had to, what had to take place um, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 4 yeah. and you shall eat neither nor grain parched or fresh until the same day until you have brought the offering of your Elohim it is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Shabbat from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat it's really strange um It's very interesting. What uh, version is this? This is the ESV. Uh, because it, it's, uh, it should have within it when he waves it so that we could be accepted. Yes. In the fifth uh, verse, fifth, 20, let me look at twenty Leviticus twenty three fifteen. It leaves that out. It, <laughs> it's amazing. It's out there. It's in verse eleven. Verse 11, and he shall wave the sheath before Yehovah to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Shabbat, the priest shall wave it. Okay, that, it's a, yeah, verse 11, uh, to be accepted, that it says to be accepted for you, but in, a, in another way, it's actually um, that we could be accepted. I mean, he is there so that He's really are the high priest. We know that the Father uh, put us in the Messiah uh, on that execution stake. We died with him there. We were buried with him. And now on this, in his resurrection, he takes uh, the very uh, life that that rolls with him into the presence of the father so that he when being that uh omer, omer of barley um that he could he could receive us back into fellowship uh, we could come back into fellowship with the father and had not this happened had not all of this happened there, nothing would have made any sense or mean anything, actually, before that, everything that went on in his death, burial, and resurrection, and also after that, there could, we would not have received the Holy Spirit, a shovel, oh, nothing. It, this particular wave offering of barley was also connected to the jealous husband the the husband uh gave this offering of the barley and it's almost like um like an atoning for uh the the harlot wife and of course we know israel built fit that, fit that uh where where the uh wife goes out she plays the harlot and then she wants to come back into you know after her her um after her lovers desert her and uh they don't want anything to do with her uh then she wants to go back to the husband uh the, the former husband um and this is the offering the barley is the offering that he gives, the jealous husband gives in relationship 
to taking her back. Uh, and because he can now take Israel back because of what Yeshua had accomplished before that in his in the shedding his own blood for the forgiveness of that harlotry of the sins. You understand what I'm saying? I, I hope this is clear. Um, that in Jerem even in like in Jeremiah 31, uh, it says, "Return, O virgin daughter of Israel." This is the state that the father basically always looks at Israel after Yeshua's shed uh, his life and his blood on that execution stake, forgiving us, justifying us, forgiving us of all of that idolatry and adultery and all of that was completely and totally once and for all erased. That's why now he takes and comes back again to the father with the with this barley wave offering, he himself. <laughs> and, and the father would say, now I can accept you back into relationship with myself, with me. You understand the, the for Israel, um, being the wife formerly, because uh, we we're engaged or married to him for, uh, at the um, at, at Mount Sinai, at the giving of the Torah, which we totally violated right away. And ultimately got cut off and and, and uh, dispersed into the nations. But um, this uh, wave offering bec becomes the key then to what will follow in uh, in the next days uh, of the unleavened bread, uh, meaning. He's showing us that we are now unleavened. We have no sin in us anymore. He doesn't see us with sin anymore. And it sets the stages for Shavuot. And the indwelling we can uh, receive in our, our very hearts, the relationship again, come back together to with the Holy Spirit to begin the process of the betrothal. Um, which takes place in the in the wilderness out in the nations. Anyway, this um, <laughs> there's a there's a lot of scriptures one can read uh, during if you want to get together with friends on the night before the seder. And sit and read, you know, and sit and read all the scripture, many scriptures that pertain to this, to Yeshua's uh, 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 being the Passover lamb. Um, and also read uh, in John the many things that Yeshua said to his disciples and done to his disciples, like the washing of the feet. There are some people that meet there. Sometimes we do it uh, the night, be, like I say, the night before the Seder, the time in which Yeshua sat with the disciples and wash one another's feet. The husband can wash the wife's feet, the wife can wash the husband's feet, um, just to show what Yeshua said You call me Lord, you call me Master and Teacher. And if I wash your feet, what is that saying? That you should also wash one another's feet. But there's more to the symbology than that. In other words, if I, if I have forgiven you, you should forgive one another. If I have served you, then you should serve one another. What he's, so he's demonstrating something this particular night that shows us that we are here and redeemed and completely forgiven 
and have our life now in the Messiah, in the resurrected Messiah, um, that we, you know, are simply servants as he was. We're servants of one another. And no matter what we do, we do to honor him, to give him glory in, in everything we do to serve another person. Um, and even, even looking at it in the form of our secular work, our jobs that we're doing, almost all work that we do, whether we're earning a wage or whether we're you know, just volunteering, we're serving others. But we need to have the, the attitude of a bond servant of the Messiah so that he can be glorified in whatever whatever we do. That this can be a wonderful night of, of remembering uh, all the things, all the scriptures that were fulfilled during this little short period of time. Um, with uh, walking through this with the Messiah.